thank you very much um, for the invitation. And uh, it's exciting to see so many people here. So I actually figured out how to see the chat when I'm talking. So if you have any questions during the talk, please just ask them on the chat or just uh, unmute yourself. Uh, if you feel like singing a song, like <laughs> we can save it for later. But, uh, but other, other than that, um, uh, yeah, please feel free to, uh, to answer questions. Let's do the questions. So let me start with uh, the general question on how we actually, why do actually uh, we want to analyze movement? Uh, what, what's the motivation for, for our work? So in our uh, laboratory at Stanford, we're working with uh, multiple populations of patients. In particular, um, one of the biggest populations that we're interested in is the population of elderly subjects with uh, neuromuscular disorders such such, such as um, osteoarthritis, Parkinson's disease, um, Alzheimer's disease, and all of those diseases affect how they walk and how they move, and this affects their social participation, and as a result, can, they can, their diseases can go worse and worse over time uh, just because they are just afraid to walk uh, and, and uh, hang out with their friends. So we would like to quantify their movements to choose the best treatment for them, and to actually just uh, know uh, at what stage of the disease they are. Similarly, for a pediatric population, we are interested in uh, cerebral palsy in particular, but also in other musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, and for that population, again, for choosing the best treatment and for the understanding where they are at their disease tra trajectory, we, um, we want to measure their movement. Finally, the third population that our lab is um, trying to help is the population of people who rely on um, assistive devices for their um, social participation. So in particular on prosthetics or on um, more, more recently on exoskeletons. Mm. And here we would like to tune parameters of those devices or choose the best device for a, a given subject. Uh, in my recent work at Stanford, we've been working with, um, particularly with a cerebral palsy population. Uh, and what happens here is normally that you have a subject coming to the clinic and a doctor asks them to walk across the room, as you can see here. And already from a video like this or from just seeing the patient, they can figure out that the patient has some uh, asymmetry of gait, has some um, abnormalities in their growth of bones, um, lands on, their, her toe, on his toes in one, uh, one leg and so on. So all those symptoms are uh, indicating that he may be struggling with uh, cerebral palsy. And based on that, on this qualitative assessment, he knows that, uh, or she knows that, um, that uh, some procedures may be, may be required. But this is only qualitative and data. So ideally, we would like to have more precise measurements than that. And for that, we um, usually ask those subjects to go to a so-called gate laboratory where the physical therapist puts markers on the lower limbs of the child. So those small white reflective markers and they ask them to walk across the room but now filled with cameras uh, as you can see here like those high frequency hack cameras that are recording positions of those markers in 2D and then reconstructing the positions of those markers in 3D. So the raw data that you will get from a trial like this uh, looks more or less like this, where you have those small dots traveling in the space. Now, based on positions of those dots in 3D, uh, since you have many of them on every part of the body, on, on lower limbs, you can reconstruct um, so-called joint, joint angles. So if you put them, a lot of them on the femur, a lot of them on the tibia, you can measure how the uh, angle in the knee actually changes. Um, so just to sum up what people do right now in uh, trying to assess um, human motion is the pipeline like this, where they first put markers on the body of the subject. They ask them to walk across the room. There are those high frequency expensive cameras. They collect trajectories of markers. They correct them with some semi-manual manual, uh, post-processing. They measure uh, body parts, as you can see here. All this data goes into a so-called inverse kinematics model uh, where they measure joint angles. Mm. Those joint angles uh, are then, the, the trajectories of those joint angles are then uh, segmented into pieces uh, so that 
um, you have each piece corresponds to uh, and, and time between uh, foot strikes. And to do, they do that in order to have those curves comparable between subjects. So if you now look at those landmarks, if you have the same landmarks for all subjects, you'll be more, um, you'll be getting more uh, normalized thinner, thinner data that is easier to compare. Finally, all that data goes to an expert who uh, generates a report. So they, they read those curves and uh, run some scripts and generate report for a doctor. Now that's all, that all works great. And uh, we get very high quality data with the system, uh, but there are lots of problems uh, which make it less affordable uh, and less accessible for, for the population. So first it takes around you know, 30 minutes to set it up. The, the whole system, setting up the whole system uh, takes like at least 30 minutes, especially for kids putting those markers is actually quite uh, painful, like cumbersome. Um, the equipment is expensive. Those high frequency cameras can cost like $100,000 or more. Um, trained personnel is required for, for running those trials. You need a physical therapist to put markers in the right positions. They can make errors since those are humans and depending on their training, they can put those markers in the wrong place and the analysis will work uh, incorrectly. You need an engineer to set up the system, to collect the data, to record it, to then process it. You need the person to visit the clinic, which is from logistics perspective, uh, again, difficult and costly, uh, since only a couple of clinics in the US are equipped with uh, such uh, sophisticated hardware. You need space in the hospital, that's scarce resource and expensive as a resource in the hospital. There are some scheduling issues, not everyone can come uh, on a given weeks and days, and like there you have just a limited, limited number of spots. Mm, everything is just time consuming and cumbersome. So what we were trying to investigate is whether instead of running this expensive and uh, uh, cumbersome process, can we just use a mobile phone to record those subjects and get enough information? From the video that I showed you at the beginning, it seemed that already in the video itself, there's enough information for the doctor to take some decisions. So maybe there is actually enough information to get um, to, 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 to go to the right decisions. So, so maybe the information there is good enough. So that's what we are trying to investigate in our um, in our recent paper. Um, the second question, if, if that is true, if we can get enough information from the video, then we would like to know whether we can detect changes over time. And this would be useful in the scenario where uh, you have a patient getting a surgery one day and you want to track them after surgery at home by just recording them with a mobile phone uh, and to know whether they should come back to a clinic or not. And that's a missing component of treatments right now for, for those uh, musculoskeletal disorders, because many times you have a doctor performing a surgery, but then after the surgery, they don't know if the surgery worked or not, because coming to the lab is just too expensive. Uh, and finally, we would like to predict who should receive a surgery. And this could be useful for screening uh, patients for um, at home. Uh, so you could imagine a scenario where a mom takes a mobile phone, records the child walking across the room, clicks the button and gets an information that they should uh, go to the clinic or that they shouldn't uh, care that much, like there, there are no problems and maybe let's recheck the, the child after a month. Um, so with that idea in mind, with the, with the idea of using a mobile phone for assessing uh, disorders in movement, we uh, came up with the following very simple, simplified uh, workflow compared to what was used before. So we, um, in our approach, we are using a single camera for recording the subject. Then we are using a key point detection algorithm that detects body landmarks without actually placing any markers on the body. Uh, so it does a similar job as these, this expensive motion capture system just without uh, placing the markers. So now you can just use any video at any time to, to find those points. And then we take trajectories of those time points, uh, put them into a neural network and generate a report automatically. And the reason for that, for in theory, we could just go directly to the report from already from, from those uh, positions. But this is a very noisy signal compared to what we get from a sophisticated hardware. So uh, this, it turned out that it doesn't work that well if we just go directly to the report. But if we denoise the data with neural networks, it turns out that uh, indeed we can get uh, meaningful results. And that was published recently in Nature Communications. Uh, you can find this uh, paper online. I will briefly des describe what we're doing there. So first, um, 
as I showed you here, the, the procedure is based on two steps. First, we run this key point detection algorithm, and then we run our neural net. The first part is already done, and there are many algorithms for finding those uh, body landmarks. Um, and one uh, big one and, and uh, well established in the community is called Open Pulse. And this algorithm was trained on a COCO data set. So they had 200,000 images to train on. And each of those images, they had 250, well, in, in all those images total, they had 250,000 uh, instances of people. And uh, within those instances, there were a total of 1.7 1, 1. million key points annotated. Uh, so those, those small dots that you, that you see here. Um, and uh, by using just standard machine learning and uh, deep learning procedures with convolutional neural networks, you can actually find those points. Given this large data set, you can train a network that finds those points and then connects the dots uh, nicely. So this, this part of the, uh, of the project is, is done. And just, just one more detail that I would like to give. Uh, sorry, I, I actually missed the, the slide with the detail of open post. Let me just show you how the open post actually performs in practice. Um, so here is the video that I showed you at the beginning. And you see that even though those observations are quite noisy, there is some good pattern that can be used for downstream analysis uh, visible in the, in the video. Similarly here, even though we have a subject with more um, um, severe cerebral palsy, you can see that the open post model performs reasonably well. Even though there's noise, there's some noise, with this extra neural network layer, we can get rid of this as I will show you in a second. Um, so for the second part of our procedure, we were using videos from the hospital. We had 1800 videos of over 1000 subjects and we had optical motion capture data for that. So we wanted, the basic idea was to try to predict this optical motion capture data, some metrics that are used in the hospital from videos themselves. Uh, so we run the first open pose on that. We find the uh, body landmarks. We see those trajectories, which are quite noisy. We use some pre-processing steps to, to denoise that. And I won't focus on that here, but like you can find details on, on pre-processing in the paper. Then we feed those into a neural network uh, in order to predict variables like uh, minimum knee flexion or gait deviation index, which is a holistic uh, metric of gait abnormality in children with cerebral palsy and in other populations. So now we, since we know Y and we know X, like this is our input, this is our output, we can train a neural network to try to predict the variables. Uh, I kind of lost track of chat, so I see that there are some new messages, but maybe let's uh, let's talk about uh, questions at the very, very end of the talk like, uh, in a couple of minutes. Mm. So, what, how, how well it performs. Um, it turned out that our model can predict the knee flexion with 0 0.83 correlation, which is already good enough for uh, potential clinical applications as we found in, in literature. Uh, if we compare the output of our network, the, the uh, accuracy of, of the output of our network with uh, what you could get directly from open polls, uh, you see that our improvement in, in correlation is quite quite large. Uh, so the, if you just use raw open post with 0 0.51 correlation in predicting knee uh, angle at maximum extension, while uh, with our model, you get 0 0.83. And that was similar with other metrics. So gate deviation index, which is this holistic metric of gate abnormality, uh, we predict that with correlation 0 0.73, which is still, um, uh, it's seen from literature that it can be used in, in practice. Um, now, the big question that usually comes up with uh, those neural networks is whether uh, this is just a black box that we cannot really figure out what is uh, happening in. And that's to some extent true, like we have just, just this black box neural network. But in practice, what you can see is that um, with uh, um, when, when you compare residuals of your models with some variable uh, that, um, that you're interested in, you can see that um, you, you can validate whether the model learns everything it could or not. So maybe let's, let me rephrase that. Uh, what we are particularly interested in is whether 
in the frontal plane that we didn't use for training. So frontal plane is what you see here on the right. Is there any information that could improve our model? So in other words, would having, um, if, if we use two cameras for training our network, not just one, could we improve the results? And it turns out that yes. Uh, if we look, for example, at the joint angle, ankle angle uh, in time and correlate that with the residual of our model, it turns out that uh, the, the ankle angle correlates with residuals, which means that we would get rid of some of the errors if only we had access to this information. So there are clear steps on how this model can be improved. Mm, and we can, uh, we can find uh, those small issues with the network uh, just by querying different variables this way. Um, now the, fine, the, the, other, the one of the questions that we were interested in is whether we can predict uh, who should receive a surgery for the, uh, that's interesting for those applications at home where you want to screen your patients potentially before sending them to a hospital in another state. And it turns out that our model, model uh, predicts whether a subject received a surgery after the visit uh, with higher uh, accuracy than, than existing models based on uh, motion capture data. So it, 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 we, you, can, you can actually get better results if you use videos than uh, compared to what we had uh, before. So um, I will show you a, at the very end a few examples on what are the next steps of, of our projects, but let me sum up what we have here so far. Um, so we found that machine learning models are really good enough for uh, quantifying gait abnormalities using a single plane video. Uh, we see that our workflow works perfectly for cerebral policy, but this could be also applied to other populations. Um, and there, there's just no, no reason why that shouldn't work. If we have a, access to a good data set, we can retrain those models for other, um, for, for other kinds of data. Um, and uh, our overarching goal is to build systems for trying to assess uh, movement in the wild. So we would like to now test whether this can actually be used in practice. And um, another obstacle that we found is that uh, some, some of those tools work only with large data sets, if we have large data sets. Uh, and um, uh, ideally, we would like to find ways to, to use smaller data sets. Um, so actually, there are some people drawing on the screen. If you draw it on the screen, it's quite disturbing for, uh, for the uh, presenter. So please, uh, please stop. <laughs> so let me show you a few results that we have in our lab, uh, just like two, three slides on, on what we're doing now. So one thing uh, that we are working on is trying to deploy those systems in practice. We would like to see uh, whether we can actually collect data in the wild. If humans at home are able to get good data for us to analyze. Uh, and we launched a study called sit to standai where you can measure your sit to stand movement, which is used for, for assessment of general physical health. Uh, and um, we use it for, for um, building a kind of health index that you can uh, collect at home. So please visit the website and, uh, and you, can, you can try it out. Uh, the beauty of that is that during the COVID pandemic, we were able to collect a lot of data just by asking subjects to record them at, cell, at home uh, by themselves, uh, which wouldn't be possible with, uh, with the pandemic otherwise, because we just cannot have subjects in the lab. And the final thing that I wanted to show is uh, the project where we are trying to use the video um, for collecting 3D, 3D motion. So here you can see that we have a video of the subject on the left. And based on that, we predict 3D kinematics. And um, so even though we, we get a 2D signal from the video, we predict 3D uh, information. And uh, this could potentially allow us to build those downstream models for uh, quantifying disease progression um, using smaller data sets that uh, compared to what we had from Gillette Children's Hospital. And that can, can be, of course, used uh, for um, clinical applications, medical applications, but also for sports. So here we have footage, uh, some old footage of a uh, pitcher, and uh, we can reconstruct some 3D movement, even though we have just uh, some noisy 2D camera video here. So that will be 
it for today. Um, thank you everyone for, for staying through the, for the entire talk. Let me uh, thank the um, co-authors of the paper that I was describing. So this Brian Young uh, was a master's student at Stanford that I worked with very closely and was the first the co-first author on this paper. Jen Hicks and uh, Apurva Ragopal are uh, researchers in the lab. Uh, Scott Delp is the PI. And Mike Schwartz was uh, fundamental in giving us insights on um, how to use the data. So he collected the data for over 30 years in the hospital and then um, helped us build those models that I was describing. And we have a few, a few funding agencies, uh, especially NIH, supporting us through multiple grants. So with that, I see already there are some questions and comments in the chat, so I'll be happy to answer that. So let me stop sharing for now, so you can see. Mm. Um, maybe we can start with the uh, earlier questions. Yeah, example, sounds good. Near Neeraj asked during your presentation, is the phone in a fixed position or held freely by a human? So in our research, we actually had uh, recordings from real cameras and not uh, from the phone, and they were held by a human. So they were in a fixed position, but like there was someone re kind of rotating the camera uh, to follow the subject. Uh, and um, yeah, that, but that's a, good, that's a good question. So like in our next study, we want to investigate whether people can actually collect those videos of high quality at home because those very basic problems come up that uh, when you hold the camera, you get lazy signal. Uh, I see a question from Levon. He's asking about uh, what do you mean by denoising uh, with neural network? Mm. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I kind of use the shortcut uh, in uh, describing here. Uh, so by denoising in this particular sense, in this particular case, I meant that the data that we get from open posts is noisy. So like there are um, joints are uh, jittering from frame to frame. There are some missing parts and so on. And now if you use this data directly to compute um, what we are interested in, so for example, joint angles, you'll find that uh, those measurements of joint angles are also noisy. And now, one of the nice properties of neural networks is that neural networks tend to smooth out your information. So you can, um, even if you have a noisy signal, they will just get rid of noisy signal to predict the variable that you care about. So the, um, I used, we, I used the neural network here in a completely normal way, like we have X and we predict Y, but uh, one way to look on those neural networks is that they actually denoise uh, the data. That's, that's just one way we're thinking about what we are doing here, but there's not, nothing, no, nothing special regarding the denoising. It's still X to Y prediction. So I see a question from Lavagne. Mm -hmm. uh, if you guys leverage in physics uh, simulation engine, so I showed uh, at the very end, I showed this 3D um, models, musculoskeletal models uh, of bones and muscles. And we are just about to start using that. The reason why we can, why it's not that straightforward is that from open post, we get 2D trajectories. So you cannot really use physics uh, if you have a 2D model of a, like a stick figure of a person. But with, if we can extract 3D trajectories of um, body landmarks, then we can use physics. And that's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So this uh, question also from Lavagna, uh, what are the significant variables from the R0.51 model? Does camera quality, stabilization, length of video, available angles on the subject affect that model performance? They would def definitely would. So um, one uh, simplification that we had here was that um, we used videos that were very clean. So the data that we got from the hospital was collected in the same room and the same light conditions and uh, everything was super clean. So those variables that you're describing are not affecting that much the output. Uh, but um, we, what we found is that for variables um, that doctors are interested in, input variables that would expect be expected to actually work worked well. So like the joint angle in the knee was most predictive of um, the holistic um, metric of, of the motion. So um, those those metrics that, that we expected to work 
worked well, while all the other parameters that you are describing here didn't affect the study, but will affect study in the long run when we when we really deploy it um, at home as we're trying now. And now we see a lot of variability with those, and those are lowering down the performance by a lot. Mm -hmm. So question from Neeraj. Um, uh, is there a potential to join the data with sensors, uh, uh, for example, mobile phone gyroscope data? That yes, comes yeah. From the object? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And there, there are multiple, well, there's at least one group at the CMU, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, that is doing exactly that. Um, then the, the question is usually, what's the uh, end goal or what's the application? So like, that's of course possible. Now the, probably you wouldn't be using that at home anymore. Like if you have mobile phone and sensors, mm, well, here you give an example of gyroscope, but like you need to have mobile, do two mobile phones in this case. Um, what people are trying to use are those suits with uh, gyroscopes on multiple body parts. Like there, there are many works where people try to use multiple data sensors, but then applications are not um, that broad as we envision it for screening patients at home. So um, yes, there are people doing that, but like we are, we are not focusing in this direction. Mm -hmm. So also a question from Neeraj, uh, do you think uh, the way that the human hand moves could give any additional cues, like site information to prove your predictions? Yes, that's quite likely. That, that would be like, we only focused on lower limbs. Uh, oh, I see. Like the, 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 there's clarification of the camera holder. So uh, in this case, it shouldn't because like that's uncorrelated information. So like if we have two people, one person is recorded, is being recorded and the second is recording, the noise or like the signal in the person who is recording shouldn't affect uh, the gate metrics of the person being recorded in any positive way. It can only make it worse. Um, but uh, in general, for the person being recorded, we were looking only on the lower limbs. If we were using more information like the hands and the torso movement, that could potentially make uh, predictions better, probably very slightly. So we didn't focus on those smaller signals, but, but indeed like the way you use hands where you're walking affects how you balance. So um, it's they're just directly correlated with uh, your ability to work. So I see questions so from Satir. Um, mm -hmm. So using a single camera from a fixed position limits the view of a person. Uh, at least this is how he understands it. Yeah. What strategies are you using to overcome it? Right. So it's I, I haven't clarified in the in the talk that it's fixed position, but it's being recorded or uh, sorry rotated by a camera holder. So in this case, and when we were collecting data at the hospital, we had a fixed camera and there was someone just, just turning it. Here for an application at home, we could imagine a mom holding the camera and again, turning it uh, left and right. And the, that introduces extra noise that has to be investigated and we haven't looked into that, but, um, but there's no problem of um, limiting the, the view of a person. Like we still see uh, the person always in the frame. Mm -hmm. Guys, do you have any other questions? You can unmute yourself and ask directly if you want. Uh, okay, I see a question from Max. Do you have any tips, uh, those uh, currently building a single camera action recognition system? So. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that's that's a good broad question. Um, so I can. Uh, yes. So so let me tell you a little bit about the study that we're running now. So we had this great result and that published in Nature Communication on the gate. But then we wanted to test whether this will work in practice, and it turned out that actually. Mm, that's not that easy to record subjects walking at home. Like people don't have enough space to actually walk 10 meters. Uh, holding the camera is difficult. And like there are lots of reasons 
why it's becoming cumbersome. So we are actually simplifying the activity for the next study. Uh, and we are doing a so-called sit to stand test where basically the subject needs to sit up and stand, uh, sit, sit down and stand up five times as fast as they can. That was shown in the literature to correlate with some health metrics. So that's, that's a natural thing to test. But like already here, we see that um, it's just like very difficult to collect any data at home and like um, questions arise like on since it's just one camera should it be the looking from the front from the side from 45 person degrees angle and so on mm, so i don't have any particular uh, tips yet but like that's the work in progress now to, to figure out what can actually what what is feasible to do at home and uh, how those different variables affect uh, the uh, the, the this system in question so uh yeah, so please come back to see our paper in a, like half a year from now. Maybe we can host another meetup, right? And uh, sure. like yeah. show your progress. Um, yeah. Okay, I see a question. Uh, is there any link available like to open parts of uh, data sets? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we couldn't release the videos themselves since they, um, contain patient health information. Uh, so we, we, we just cannot ask those subjects to, to release their videos. But what we did was we ran this open pulse algorithm for finding the key points, those skeletons. Uh, and this is already de-identified because faces of subjects are not visible. So we published this data set. So we have like a few thousand trajectories of people walking processed with this open pulse algorithm. Uh, and that's exactly the data set that we trained our network on. So this I will share the link. So we have this, we have code of our um, network also released. There's a paper. So maybe I'll, I'll share uh, all the links with Sophia and uh, we can. Yeah, I mean, we will it publish it in, in, in Slack channel. Uh, so you guys can find it there. And also your, your paper uh, about your work, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see another question. Do you think it would be possible to train a neural network to learn a representation of movement invariant under those kinds of uh, differences in perspective. Uh, that's yes, that's a that's a good question, and uh, I think this would be super interesting and very valuable. And like, like that, that address this, this could potentially address the uh, one of the issues that we have. So maybe let me start back with the with the actual issue. Uh, one of the problems is that for doing what we did, we really had to use this super large data set of like a few thousand videos from a hospital collected over 30 years. And that's very rare in uh, um, uh, like medical community to have like that nice data. So now if you wanted to use it for a smaller population, our technique like, would unlikely work. And the one way to deal with that would be to build this representation of movement uh, invariant um, to, to different uh, perspectives and so on as uh, Niraj is, is suggesting. For that, we would need to have another large data set first to just get a lot of different human movements and build this low, low rank representation, like the PCA kind of uh, principal components of movement in some sense, and then use those as predictors for uh, neurological or, or any other disorders. So this should potentially work. It's just like, uh, yeah, it's good probably to get another NIH, 1 million NIH grant for something like this. But as soon as you have that, it would be very useful for everyone. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I, we don't have any other questions. Uh, I think it will be recorded. Like someone is uh, asking. It's, 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 it's recorded. Uh, it's recorded and I will share on, uh, on, on Slack. Uh, as yeah. well. Um, uh, Lucas, it was great. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you very much. It was fun.